Hi everyone, my name is Shirini, um, and today I want to present something that I have written for a doctoral course last year, and it's about the consequences of misfits, uh, and more specifically, more specifically um, I'm linking the A misfits, so the abilities misfits, to information seeking, uh, and then in the context of this difficult thing here, it's human potential fulfillment in the workplace, which is actually also um, the topic of my PhD. So I'm, I started a year ago uh, <coughs> with a PhD on uh, the development of human potential in the workplace. So I'm actually not a PE fit researcher, but I wanted to give you some context uh, to explain how I come to this idea. And we are talking about human potential fulfillment in general and a more specific in the workplace as a developmental process. And in the workplace, we are focusing on the optimal use of people's abilities, but also on their development of their full capacities. And it was actually um, during my brainstorm on the, le on the letter, so the development of uh, people's capacities, that I came up um, with something that I've seen earlier. So you have to know that I'm a big animal lover and I frequently watch Animal Planet. And on Animal Planet, there was a documentary about animal intelligence or animal learning. And I had to think about this. It was about how um, animals can develop really complex uh, problem-solving capacities, which we uh, would normally not expect from them. So they really evolve in their capacities. And which I, I um, witnessed there was that these animals often develop their capacities when they are confronted with a type of misfit. Now, this is a particular type of misfit uh, which relates to what you know as Timon's abilities misfit. So what you see here are actually chimps uh, from the Jane Goodall research. I don't know if you know her. And they are often confronted with um, food, which is actually really hard to get by. So in this case, they are looking for insects which are hidden in woods, but they are also confronted with uh, fruits which have really hard peels, which they can't open. So insects they can't uh, get by, fruits they cannot peel, and what you see them doing is actually when they are confronted with these types of misfits, things they cannot solve immediately, for which they don't have the abilities yet, they start e exploring the situation. So they start um, showing these explorative behaviors, which ultimately, in the end, can enable them to develop their capacities. In this case, they uh, learn to use twigs to get insects, but they also use, learn to use uh, stones to break fruits. And actually, while uh, thinking about this, because I'm not studying animals, of course, I'm studying people, I was thinking about the same thing with people. And as a psychology student, I had to think about developmental psychology, in which I don't know if you know her, Ainsworth has a really popular attachment theory, in which he states that a lot of development in people actually finds place through exploration. Um, and also, when you see children uh, show these explorative behaviors with could also, which could lead to development, you see that they often do it uh, when they are confronted with some type of misfit. So, for example, here you have this box. Children have to figure out which block goes into which hole. Um, they often don't get that at the start, but they start exploring, they start experimenting, looking for information, observing, <coughs> uh, showing all types of behavior. So this actually made me think um, could it be that a kind of demands abilities misfit, the kind of misfit that we see here, could trigger a, um, explorative behavior also in people, and that this ultimately could result in uh, ability development? Now, of course, I want to study this in the context of organizations, so I had to know if this is also something we could witness there and if it's relevant in the context of um, organizations. So I did find that it was relevant in the sense that there's a lot of research telling us about the fact that uh, the economic situation in which organizations are currently operating is changing. So the changes result from the globalization of markets and linked to that also uh, changes in technology, which actually face organizations with evolving demands. And these evolving demands trickle down in a way up to the uh, level of the job of the employees. So what we see is this evolving demands uh, which, um, which trickle down up to the level of the employees. And this actually makes the whole um, demands abilities misfit something inevitable for organizations. So even when they are recruiting for fits, we can still expect misfits to um, yeah, be present at one point in time. Um, 
And at the same time, uh, we see that employee development is actually uh, proposed as one of the most important flexibility tools for organizations to cope with these kinds of demands, abilities, misfits. So this made me um, conclude that exploring the, the link between DA misfits and explorative behavior could be interesting with the eye on uh, employee development. So that's what brought me to person environment fit research because I was looking for, okay, can I, so I'm expecting this demands, abilities, misfits that can trigger explorative behaviors. Do we have something, do we have a concept like that in organizational research already? And that's what brought me to your domain. Um, and here I was looking for a definition of misfit that was kind of neutral because I don't see it as something that is inherently negative or detrimental for people or organizations. I actually see it as something that could be negative but doesn't <coughs> need to be. So that's why I chose that definition. And of course, I'm looking at the development of abilities. So um, I focused on demands, abilities, misfits. Uh, and there I make a distinction between two types. So on the one hand side, I um, look into a situation of misfits where the demands exceed abilities. And on the other hand side, I look into a type of misfits where the abilities exceed job demands. Okay, so I was interested, so, so uh, thinking about the relevance of the misfit in organizations and also thinking about the fact that it could be something posit positive, I was really interesting, uh, interested to find out what was already known about it. And to my surprise, I actually saw that uh, not much is known about misfits. And as Cooper, and Cooper Thomas and Wright say, it's actually been a neglected topic in the PE fit research literature. Um, and why, or, or what are the reasons for this? So the, uh, most of the times they um, point to the ASA model, which was one of the starting models in your literature stream, um, which actually uh, goes out from the fact that um, people are selected into organization based on fit, and when they come into an organization and don't fit, they will simply leave. So it's rather static view on, a peop on people and environments which are kind of fixed, and if they don't match, you just go away. Um, and in, in the realm of this uh, model, a lot of empirical studies have also been focusing on the fact that uh, it's fit that we are looking for. So a lot of evidence has been showing positive outcomes of fit. And the thing that we know about misfit is just that fit is negatively correlated to um, outcomes such as turnover and strain. So the less we fit, the more there is stress, uh, the more likely we are to leave the company. So based on these results, uh, a lot of scholars have actually concluded that it is fit that is desirable, and it is misfit that is undesirable. And this was, of course, not in line with what I, or not in line with the point I started from. So I was looking for an alternative theory which could explain the ideas I had. And here I um, found work adjustment theory by Davis and Lovequist, and they actually take a more dynamic perspective in the sense that they don't see the environment and the person as something given. They also um, elaborate on the possibility that both can change. Um, and so they say only when um, an employee's efforts to establish fit fail, then he will leave the organization. So they actually nuance this a bit. Uh, and this was um, also what I was saying. And then at the same time, they also are talking about this active employee, so active uh, adjustments where they uh, adjust the environment, but also reactive adjustments where they um, alter themselves. So this was the theoretical framework I'm building on. Uh, and more specifically, so I, I started from the idea that the misfit could trigger explorative behaviors. Now, exploration is a really broad concept. Um, and it had to be relevant also in the context of organizations, and that's what led me to information seeking. And um, although it was not the, the relation with DA misfit and, and information seeking is not explicitly been um, evidenced by, by research yet, we do see uh, some, um, some articles already that point to that direction. Uh, more importantly, we have um, articles on feedback seeking. So feedback seeking 
is a type of information seeking where the information is actually uh, about the suitability of one's goal behavior, about one's performance. And it was already Ashford who um, said more than 30 years ago that it's a really important adaptation tool for um, employees to adapt their behavior to the environment, to uh, tailor their behavior to have a better fit there. And then 30 years later, the same idea was actually picked up by Parker and Collins, who in their paper describe um, feedback seeking as a proactive tool for employees to uh, obtain this DA fit. And then a couple of years ago, this whole idea was also empirically evidenced by a study by De Vlo, who actually found a relationship between DA uh, fit and uh, DA misfit and uh, feedback seeking. So this was um, a bit of the, the, the um, studies which I built on to, to, to make this link between DA misfit and information seeking as an explorative behavior. But at the same time I felt, and it was in the reviewers' comments too, that feedback, um, as we understand it, it's about performance. So you are going to ask about the suitability of your performance, which um, helps you to assess if there is a misfit, but which also helps you to identify where your weaknesses are. This is an important um, type of information, but it doesn't really capture the idea of exploration I had. So I felt it, it was a bit um, too limited in that way. And that's why I chose information seeking as a broader category of employee behavior. Um, so I, I worked with the concept uh, by Morrison, it's information seeking. And what was also um, interesting here is that she really works with a different theoretical explanation for why people would use information seeking. She uses it as a tool to cope with uncertainty. So if you look in PFIT research, I don't often find real theoretical explanations for why people are achieving FIT or why they are responding to misfit. And this um, comes a bit closer to that explanation. So I wanted to tell a bit more about it. So information seeking as a broad category uh, contains multiple types of information. I wanted to look uh, at those types of information that are relevant um, concerning DA misfits. So I told you already performance feedback is relevant, is relevant in the sense that it helps you to identify weaknesses in your performance. But at the same time, I also thought that people, when they know where their weaknesses are, they also have to have information about how they can uh, do something about it, how they can improve their abilities. And that's why I also look at technical information. So that's about how to perform your work. And then in another, uh, in another type of information is opportunity information. This is related to a DA misfit in which your abilities actually exceed the demands. So here I'm more focused on um, the altering of the demands and information that could be relevant in this case is actually information about uh, opportunities in your environment to uh, know what is possible with these demands, what you could alter there. So these are the three types of information I'm looking at. Then um, Morrison also makes a distinction between personal sources and impersonal sources. Personal are coworkers, are supervisors, impersonal are written documents. And finally, she um, borrows a concept by Ashford and Cummings, which are actually seeking strategies. And you have inquiry as a strategy. This is just directly asking other people for information. And you have monitoring as a strategy. This is actually a more indirect way where you observe information. Uh, from uh, You observe the situation, you observe others. You observe both. So this is what I took with me. And then concerning the, the theoretical part, which Morrison used to, um, to actually um, theorize the, the use of information seeking, is uh, uncertainty reduction theory. So she actually says that um, people, when they have feelings of uncertainty, will um, engage in behaviors aimed at reducing this uncertainty and at the same time do this to regain control over their environment. And although there is no, there of, not to my knowledge, there is uh, no direct evidence between DA misfits and uncertainty, we do have a lot of in, um, evidence showing that DA misfit is linked to stress and strain. And uh, there is also research uh, showing that uncertainty is a really 
important predictor of stress, which could actually be a bit of a hidden factor here. So we only see the stress part, but maybe the uncertainty is um, uh, going prior to this. And this also gives us a chance to um, explain both kind of outcomes of misfit in a way that stress in itself is not necessarily something bad. It actually refers to a feeling of arousal. And this feeling of arousal is something that you can perceive positively in the sense that you can see it as a challenge. And this can energize you to, for example, approach a problem. But at the same time, you can perceive it as something negative, more as a threat. And in this case, you will uh, be more inclined to withdraw from the situation. So it also holds the possibility to explain both type of outcomes. So these are two things I found really interesting about um, this approach. So I started um, working on this hypothesis to see how DA misfit could um, be related to information seeking. And as I said before, in the case of a misfit where your demands exceed the abilities, um, uh, I reasoned that when you see this as a, so there are boundary conditions in this way that not everybody will um, be an active employee increasing abilities. But when you perceive this as something challenging, I do believe that people will look for information and will look for two types of information. On the one hand side, the performance feedback. I reason that they will look for performance feedback with their supervisor because this person is formally authorized to give them uh, this performance feedback, but it's normally also qualified to give them this feedback. At the same time, I reasoned that this is a really vulnerable situation for the person because, yes, his, his actually his abilities are not what they're supposed to be uh, um, compared to the demands. So he will probably not directly ask his supervisor for this performance feedback, but will opt for the um, monitoring strategy because this one actually um, has the advantage that you um, do it indirectly by observing so you don't, do not um, risk or, or you, there is less risk to uh, damage your self-esteem here. And then at the other hand, I also figured, so okay, we have this performance feedback, we use it to identify uh, the weaknesses in our performance, but we also need information about how to deal with it. And that's where the technical information comes in. And here I reasoned that we would look for this kind of information with our coworkers. Why? Because coworkers are um, more, are, are, um, more close to us physically often, but also are more close to the job tasks we perform in, um, compared to the supervisor. And here I reasoned that we would use inquiry. Why inquiry? Because when you need uh, technical information, this is often a complex kind of information, which is also uh, often tested. So it's really difficult to get by observing. And that's why I thought it would be more logic for them to ask it to their coworkers. And then as a boundary condition, this is something that it's also even mentioned in developmental psychology that children will only explore when they have the feeling that they are secure. So I also had a feeling that people will um, probably be influenced by the relationship they have with the source. Uh, from which they will gain information. And this is where uh, I um, introduced the boundary conditions of positive relationships at work. And it builds on several theories. For example, Kahn with his holding environment, which actually states that if you have positive relationships, you um, can uh, more effectively deal with anxiety arousing situations. Uh, another theory is psychological safety theory, which we find with Shine and Edmondson. Um, that actually says that when you have a positive relation with someone, you um, have less fear to show vulnerability and you will be uh, less or you will perceive less risk to damage your um, self image. So I operationalized this as high quality connections. Uh, it's a recent construct um, developed by Dutton and Heapy, and I chose it because this construct really focuses on the quality you have with a specific person. So I thought this one was the most um, uh, appropriate here. So introducing these, um, I reasoned that there could be um, some change in the relations that I predict, being that if you uh, are confronted with a misfit in which your demands exceed your abilities, and you're going to look for performance feedback, 
um, which you would normally do by monitoring. I predict that when you have a good of a high quality connection with your supervisor, you will perceive less risk to show vulnerability. You will perceive less risk to damage your self-esteem. And I, um, I reason that this will uh, trigger you maybe to change your strategy from monitoring to asking, because with asking you can get a lot more information, a lot more detailed information as well. So generally it's better to um, obtain good information and as, as the risk to damage your self-esteem is lower here, this could be um, a shift that, that can happen. Uh, uh, in contrast, when there is no high quality connection with your supervisor at all, I expect that the monitoring goes up because you will uh, certainly not um, place yourself or, or the, the risk you perceive to damage your self-esteem will be even higher in this situation, so you won't ask. And then the other uh, relation is the one with the technical information. And here I had similar thoughts. So if high quality connections with your coworkers are present, then the asking goes up because you're, you're not busy with um, damaging your self-esteem in any way. Whereas if the high quality connections with coworkers are absent, um, you, you will perceive more risk to damage your self-esteem, your self-image. So you will likely shift from asking to monitoring. And then finally, a lot of people also asked me why I didn't, uh, at first didn't reason about the case where demands are lower than your abilities, because I thought it was not, it didn't really um, match my uh, human potential fulfillment framework, uh, which was focused on developing abilities. But um, looking at it uh, afterwards, I actually found that it did also uh, match the whole reasoning behind the other case of misfits, um, the only difference here would be the type of information. So here you are in a situation where your demands um, or where, you, where your abilities exceed the demands of, your, of the situation. So you actually uh, can be inclined to uh, alter something in your environment, alter something in your demands. And to do that, you would need uh, information about development, developmental opportunities. So this is another type of information where you look for, for example, opportunities to uh, engage in special projects or engage in developmental courses, in traineeships, etc. And here I reasoned that because you're not really in a weak situation, you're not underperforming in a way, um, you will not have the you you will not have a high perceived risk of damaging your um, self-image. So that's why I um, predict that you will use inquiry and you will do it with your supervisor because he's, again, probably the most knowledgeable person about which opportunities are possible within the company and is also the one who has the power to decide on this. So that's why I, I added this one at the end. Okay, and that's actually the, uh, that's what I wanted to say to you. So thank you for the presentation. Thank you.